Thomas, Sheldon Leonard, and Carl Reiner were looking for a fresh face to play. Mary was the runner-up they remembered. All I knew is that when she walked into the office after I saw maybe 60, I swear, 60 people, I said to Sheldon, I'll never find the girl I'm looking for. He said, you'll know when you hear it. He gave me the script, and I started to read it with him. My heart just fluttered out of control. She had two lines, and I stopped her. I heard something in her voice that got to me. He put his hand on my head, just like that, and he said, come with me. And he lifted me up out of the chair, and we tore down the hallway and turned right into Sheldon Leonard's office, Danny Thomas's partner, who was going to produce this show, and said, sit down and read it again with me. And he's going like this to the guys. Look at this. And we read it again. And I don't know what was so special, but they all thought it was. And um, the next day, before noon the next day, I got a call from my agent. You've got the job. It was the role that propelled Mary Tyler Moore into the national spotlight. Placing her in the company of Hollywood's most creative talent, and a for excellence, which became her trademark. Biographies look at Mary Tyler Moore will continue on A and E. America at the dawn of the 1960s was an exciting time. A new frontier of science and politics and pop culture. Looks good, eh? It was the perfect stage for 23-year-old Mary Tyler Moore. Up to this point in her career, she had only been cast as an attractive second banana. But now, Mary was in the middle of television's most talented bunch. Rosemary, Maury Amsterdam, and of course, the Broadway song and dance sensation, Dick Van Dyke. On September 10, 1961, America tuned in and saw the birth of a show that changed the face of television comedy. The show became a landmark. Originally designed as a vehicle for Carl Reiner, called Head of the Family, the new show was retooled and its new cast distinguished itself by stretching the fabric of television conventions. The Dick Van Dyke Show was, in part, an autobiography of Reiner's stint as a writer for Sid Caesar's show of shows. And Reiner was determined to give the typical sitcom format a fresh new perspective. <laughs> Up until the Dick Van Dyke Show, the, the wives were, were extensions of their husbands. They weren't people in their own right. But Laura was, was a person in her own right, and, um, and I, I will take credit for this. I was the one who said, this is the way she's going to look. I don't wear frocks. Mary was everybody's thing up there. I thought she was gorgeous. When we went into the cutting room to cut, I just loved looking at her. Everybody did. And uh, when she wore capri pants, every male in America went nuts. My son actually touched her behind once when he passed out. She talked about it. <laughs> She was 23 at the time and had never been in the comedy. She picked it up so fast. Why? And her title was inherent. It was always there. It you win. She found out she had a sense of humor. She no question about that. She knew where to laugh for. All I hoped was that I could hold my head up with the rest of them. He, he got you to say something embarrassing, didn't he? What was it? <laughs> that Alan Brady is bald. <laughs> she was a perfect straight man. I mean, she made me funny. There's a lot of comedians, and as they say, very few good straight men, and she was the best. I am surprised you didn't blab about his nose being fixed. <laughs> Now it was a secret. I think the fact that the Mary and Dick were dancers gave the, the whole program a grace that very few programs have. Comedy has a rhythm to it, and singing and dancing all has a rhythm, which is why I love those three. And Mary had the, you know, those great instincts for that. And we danced and sang together very well right from the beginning. 
There was something about the match of voices and everything. We were both kind of tall and thin. Everything just worked. Ironically, Mary's most comical moments were often the result of tears. I copied Nanette Fabreg. I out and out admit it. You knew that was a secret, didn't you? <laughs> I had actually watched her just for her comedy before that, um, just because there was some connection I felt to her. I'm so unhappy. And so I copied her. <laughs> And I watched how she would look skyward, <laughs> and she would hyperventilate, and all those things that I incorporated into my own experience with crying. She was brilliant at it. She became, her voice became kind of Hepburnish, and it became very much like that. Bob, uh, as you know, Alan, I, <laughs> you see, <laughs> when I, well, I, what, what, what? The Dick Van Dyke Show struck a chord with television audiences. It seemed to mirror the youthful spirit of the new frontier, and Rob and Laura seemed to suggest the look of, of suburban Kennedys in a middle-class Camelot. But the fantasy was destroyed on November 22, 1963. We were on the, the set rehearsing the Van Dyke Show, and I remember the prop man who came out of his little room where he had a radio playing, and he interrupted the director. And uh, John Chalet, our, our first assistant director, was sitting in the living room, said, crying. We said, what's the matter, John? And I saw John's face fall, and he told us that President Kennedy had been shot, and nobody could quite believe it, uh, but surely he would recover from it, because how could that happen? And then we went into a place where we had a television set and we watched Walter Cronkite and we watched him take off those glasses and put them back on and then make the announcement. We all just sat down and sat there for the afternoon. We didn't rehearse. Um, and we came back the following week and had to um, had to redo the ending of an episode in which somebody had given Rob and Laura a little turtle with a painting on its back. And there had been a picture of Laura Petrie and Rob drawn on the back of this turtle. And I look at it and I say, oh, we look just like the Kennedys, don't we? And dun, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun. And we had to go back and redo that. That, um, that incident in history changed me tremendously, as it did so many people. It's not just a sad and uh, shameful thing, but it was a precipice. While audiences didn't see the heartbreak behind the humor, they did recognize the emergence of Mary as a pioneer of the new frontier of television comedians. The challenge of staging a hit half-hour comedy week after week was forging Mary's dramatic skills and opening her eyes to greater career possibilities. You are watching Showbiz Sweethearts Week on Biography. The life of Mary Tyler continues Rob and Laura Petrie were television's perfect couple. Every week, millions of homes tuned in, making the Dick Van Dyke Show the most popular comedy program of the early 1960s. Alan, whatever you were going to say to Laura, I would rather you said to me. Okay, Rob. You're a beautiful girl. <laughs> the television relationship of Mary and Dick stood in stark contrast As to Mary's relationship with real-life husband Richard Meeker. The long hours in rehearsal, the time away from her own son Richie, and the pressures of work were contributing to the distance between husband and wife. Married too young, they were now drifting apart. Yet as suddenly as she fell into the role of Laura, Mary fell in love with an advertising agency executive attached to the program. 
One evening while filming on the set of The Dick Van Dyke Show, Mary met Grant Tinker. They were both dazzled. It was love at first sight. He was in the process of ending his marriage, and Mary was in the process of ending hers. But in Mary's case, it was instantaneous. I kind of knew at the moment I met him. In my case, her impact on me was, was immediate. He asked if I wanted to go out to dinner, and I said, no, I think it's a little too close to me. To, you know. Separation and divorce from my husband, so thank you. This woman walked into my life who was exactly the woman that I had never really seen or only vaguely imagined. He said, that's, I understand. And he started to leave the set. And then he caught himself and turned around and came back. And he said, well, let me ask you this. A friend of mine has a house in Palm Springs. Would you like to come and stay with me for the weekend? <laughs> and I said, no, thank you. I think that's out of the question, too. They only six months after they met. We wanted to sneak into somewhere and get married. And sneak out and, 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 we, and we managed that at, uh, in Las Vegas. I think it was 11 in the morning and we were out of there by 1.30 in the afternoon and coming back to Los Angeles. A new husband, a hit show, and an Emmy Award confirm Mary's personal and professional arrival. But at the end of its fifth year, at the height of its popularity, the Dick Van Dyke Show did something no other top-rated program had ever done. It stopped production. The cast and the creative team never wanted the program to get stale, to lose that sense of vitality that was at the core of its appeal. So in 1966, feeling their best work had been accomplished, the show disbanded. While her television family looked forward to some fresh opportunities, Mary's own career took some severe 